What's up guys, we're going to be taking a look at this lab, DOM cross-site scripting using web messages and json.pass. This is part of the DOM vulnerabilities category of the Portswigger labs, and it's the third of three labs on the topic of web messages. If you're not sure what web messages are, you might want to recap on the earlier two labs. Right now, we're going to assume that you know what web messages are and the basics behind how they work. Like many cross-site scripting labs, the objective is to call the print function in the user's browser. Without further ado, let's access the lab. So here's the main page on the lab. If we scroll down, we'll see a number of boxes appearing on the page. These are actually iframes and every so often a new iframe will load up. This is clearly not the intended functionality of the page. And without even looking at the page source, we can see something is clearly bugged with this particular web page. Taking a look in Burp Suite, we can see the page source. And the most interesting part of this page, there's some JavaScript. Now on a side note, take a look at how easy this JavaScript is to read. This JavaScript should ideally be minified or obfuscated in some way. Of course, it's still possible to read the JavaScript even if it's been obfuscated, but why make things easy for an attacker? Now it is a fair sized block of JavaScript, so let's work through this bit by bit. Window.addEventListener. So it's setting up an event listener on the page that event listener is listening for a web message. And upon receiving the web message, it then executes the callback function. And we can see the callback function takes E as an argument, which simply represents the event or web message in this case. We then have the variable iframe being declared. This is also fairly old school JavaScript. We don't see var too much. The other thing we don't see too often is several variables being declared on a single line of code. It's completely valid JavaScript. I just don't see it too much personally. Again, might indicate the person writing the JavaScript is not really familiar with current conventions. Technically, there's nothing wrong with this. What do I mean by multiple variables being declared on a single line? Well, we have the variable iframe that's being initialized as document.create element iframe. So an iframe is being created we then have a comma and then we have a second variable being declared. This variable has the name Acme player equals and it's assigned to the value of an object. We can see that object has one key element and the property is iframe. That is our newly created iframe. Finally, we have another comma and we have D. D is a third variable. It's just not being initialized with a value. It's simply being declared as the variable D. So we could also write this piece of code on three lines where we say var iframe equals. Then on a second line, we have var ACME player equals. Then on a third line, we have var D. Or if we're using more modern JavaScript, it would usually be let instead of var. We then access the body of the document and call the append child method. And passed to that method, we have our iframe. In other words, we are attaching our newly created iframe to the page. We then have a try block. The idea behind a try block is it's JavaScript that could result in an error, but instead of causing the whole page to freeze up, if an error is inside a try block, then the JavaScript can continue without issue. And if there is an error, then the error is passed to this catch method. And we can see in this case, it simply returns. In other words, it exits the JavaScript anyway in this case. Inside the try block, we are assigning a value to our newly declared variable D, and the value of D is going to be json.pass e.data. The json.pass method takes in a JavaScript object as a string and converts it into a JavaScript object. Very often when data in JSON format is sent over the wire or it's communicated by means of a web message, it's actually sent in string format. You might hear the term serialized to indicate it's been placed in a format that's suitable for transportation. But that's just a fancy way of saying it's JSON, but in a string format. JSON.pass takes that JSON in string format and converts it into a JavaScript object. Where is it getting the JSON in string format? It's the value of e.data. e.data, remember e is the event, and really in this case, the event is the page has received a web message, and e.data is the value of that web message. And the idea is that web message value should be JSON in string format. 
But the end result is now that D is assigned a JavaScript object, which is based on that JSON that's part of the web message. So now that we have this JavaScript object D, we then have a switch block. The idea with a switch block in JavaScript is it looks at the value passed in the parentheses. So it looks at the value of D.type and depending on the value of D.type, a specific code block will be executed. For example, if the value of D.type is page load, then we'll execute the code acmeplayer.element.scroll into view. As we can see, there are three different values that we might see for D.type. Might be page load, it might be load channel, it might be player height changed. Now we are going to ignore two of those blocks of code. We're going to focus on case load channel. And the reason why we're interested in this block of code, because if we have a look at what it does, it sets the source of the iframe. Just as a quick recap, if you've lost track of what ACME has to do with the iframe, remember we declared the variable ACME, it has a key element and the value of that element is iframe. So ACME player dot element is the same as iframe dot source means we're setting the value of iframe dot source. We're then setting it to the value of D dot URL. So remember D is an object, which means it can have several keys on the object. So one of the keys on the object is type. Another key that's evidently on this object is URL. As a general guide, and this is something we've seen in previous labs, anytime we're able to specify a URL as part of a piece of code, for example, iframe.source, there's also a chance that we can execute JavaScript directly making use of what we can refer to as JavaScript colon. It's essentially inlined JavaScript that's executed directly. Now, I like to get a little bit of proof of concept before crafting the exploit. One of the things that might help is to set up an event listener on the page. We can do that in the console. So we can type window dot add event listener. We can listen for the message event, and then we can provide a callback function and all this callback function is going to do is simply log out the value of e.data. So we're basically telling the page, if you do receive a web message, just log it out to the console for us so we can see what the web message is. Now, for example, if we were to type window.post message, we can send the message here. Once we send the web message to the window, it's also going to get console logged out because we have that event listener in place. Now, because we can read the page source so easily in JavaScript, we know exactly what the page is listening for. It's listening for a JavaScript object. Although remember this JavaScript object is going to be in JSON stringified format. And we know that that specific object has to have two keys. So the first key is type, and we're going to set that to load channel. And the second key is URL. And the value of URL is ultimately going to be assigned to the source of our iframe. Now, if you're wondering why this page is routinely adding iframes, well, you can see that we're not necessarily the only person who is posting messages to the window. For example, you can see I have MetaMask installed for managing crypto wallets. Well, that's obviously just generated a web message. The problem is every time the page receives a web message, the first thing it does is create a new iframe element. So this is obviously really, really badly constructed source code for this page. The longer we leave this page open, the more iframes are going to ultimately load. For now, we're just going to ignore any additional web messages that pop up and we are going to craft our own web message. Let's define a variable. We'll say let payload equals and in string format, we're going to write some JSON. So JSON usually likes to make use of double quotes for each key value pair. The first key is going to be type. We make use of the colon character. Then we're going to specify the value of the key type, which is going to be page load in this case. We then separate key value pairs with a comma. So we'll place a comma, another open double quote for the next key value pair. The next key is going to be URL. And the value of that is going to be our payload, which is JavaScript colon print. So we can see that although this is JSON, it's not really JSON yet. It's actually a string that contains JSON data. It's only after this particular string is passed to the JSON.pass method that it actually becomes a valid JavaScript object. 
Next thing we're going to do is post this string as a web message to the page. Window dot post message will pass the value payload. Press enter. And by the way, nothing happened because I actually passed the wrong value for type. So let's define payload two. Instead of page load, it was actually supposed to be load channel. So let's try that again. So payload two as a post message. Notice we get print pop up to the page. So that's really the key idea behind the vulnerability in this lab. The next step is to head to the exploit server and run the exploit. So just as a quick recap, the idea behind the exploit server is we are pretending that a victim has visited an attacker controlled domain. We're then going to load the vulnerable lab up inside an iframe on the attacker controlled domain. Now we're going to make use of the payload directly. And we can see that there is a constant here, which we need to replace with our lab ID. Okay, let's take a quick look at the payload. So first of all, we are loading up an iframe on the attacker controlled domain. And the reason why we're doing it this way is because it's very easy to post to an iframe on attacker controlled domain. That's because we own the page source and hence the JavaScript on the attacker controlled domain. Whereas if the victim is visiting the lab directly, it's hard to generate post messages to the page because we don't own the page source. So that's why we are assuming the victim is visiting attacker controlled domain. So we've set up an iframe. The iframe is going to load up the vulnerable lab. And as soon as it's finished loading, we have this attribute on load. We are going to post a message to the iframe and you should recognize our JSON object in string format. There is however, one key difference. You will notice that the double quotes inside the JSON object are escaped. They have a backslash before them to indicate that they are part of the string and should not be taken as a termination of the string. When we were working in the console, we simply used a single quote for the full JSON object and were therefore able to use double quotes inside the JSON string without terminating the string. You might think, well, why can't we just do this here? Why can't we just use single and double quotes? Keep in mind, we are inside a HTML attribute on load and you can see it's making use of a single quote. So if we try and wrap our JSON object in single quotes, it's also going to terminate the HTML attribute. So in this case, because we are writing this JSON object inside a HTML attribute, it's now necessary to start making use of escape characters. All this backslash says is that the double quote immediately following the backslash is part of the string and not a string terminator. Everything else inside this JSON object is the same as the JSON object that we crafted. The only additional aspect to take note of is that the post message is receiving a second argument, which is this asterisk or wildcard sign. The second argument passed to the post message is the target origin. It defines where the web message is allowed to be sent. The reason why is so we can ensure that our web message is not intercepted by a malicious actor. In this case, if you make use of the asterisk, we're basically saying we do not care where this web message is sent. Since we're posting this message cross origin, so we're posting the message from the attacker control domain to the iframe, it is necessary to provide this second parameter. If we don't provide the second parameter, then the web message will never be dispatched to the iframe. Now we've written our payload. Let's choose the store option. And for a little bit of fun, we can choose the option to view the exploit. So this is what the victim will see. They'll visit the attacker controlled page. On that page will be an iframe. The attacker controlled domain then sends a post message to the iframe. That's the JSON object that we constructed, which then causes the JavaScript to be executed inside JavaScript colon, which is just the arbitrary print message in this case. But in a real world scenario, it would obviously be malicious JavaScript. Back to the exploit server, we can now choose the option deliver exploit to victim to solve the lab. This simulates the victim visiting the attacker controlled domain in the background. And if the JavaScript print method is executed on the page, we get the flag. Congratulations, you solved the lab. So if you combine this lab with the previous two labs, you should have a fairly good idea of how web messages work and how you might exploit a vulnerability involving the way that web messages are handled by a web application.
Ultimately, this was a type of cross-site scripting attack because we were able to execute arbitrary JavaScript from within the victim's browser. And it was a type of DOM-based cross-site scripting attack because the JavaScript we were injecting into ultimately manipulated the DOM. It was creating an iframe, attaching it to the DOM. We were then able to manipulate the value of iframe.source. We set that to the value of JavaScript colon. All right, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next lab.